Good morning. Good morning, good day. Welcome to those of you that are here in this room and those of you that are joining us from around the world. Wherever you are joining us from at this time, I am grateful to God for this privilege, this opportunity that we can be a part of what the Holy Spirit is doing in the earth in these last days. Nobody want to really hear about that, but it needs to be said. God has been speaking about it from the very beginning. God who knows the end from the beginning before time begun, he set the earth, the present heaven and earth was created within a, a, an expiry date framework, if you may. And God spoke about it in Genesis, all throughout the Old Testament, coming into the New Testament when Jesus Christ came in time, the end of the end was activated. Yesterday in the fasting meeting, as we look at times and seasons, one of the things that it was said in one of the scripture in Daniel chapter 8, is that there is an appointed time for the end. And the present church today, preachers don't talk about it because many of them don't even know anything about it. They don't care to know anything about it because they only see themselves living for this life and nothing beyond this. One of the scripture we also looked at yesterday in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it tells us that if it was only in this life, we have hope in Christ, we would be the most, like the New King James and some other versions said, the most pitiable. I, 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 I understand what that is saying, but I, I, I tend to like what the old King James version says, we would be the most miserable. So even that tells us clearly that there is a life beyond this life. In the Old Testament, in the book of Job, and history reveals that the book of Job would have been the oldest book of the Bible. And Job asks a question. He says, if a man dies, shall he live again? Think about that question. Job is asking this, Christ has not yet been revealed. There's certain revelation that has not yet been given. So at the time that he exists, he's seeing death. They're experiencing death because we know that from the time man sinned, the physical body experienced death because the first death was spiritual death. And Job looked and saw everything and what was happening to him he asks the question, if a man dies, shall he live again? Then he says this. Though after my skin, worm may destroy my flesh. So we know that when a person dies, worm destroys the body, decay and all of that. He said, yet in my flesh shall I see God. But even in that very moment, the statement he made, he believed that there was something beyond. Yet in my flesh shall I see God. Yet in my flesh shall I see God. For I know that my Redeemer lives. He shall stand on the earth in the latter days. Job is saying that. <laughs> Without anything else. Wow. People. Christ came and fulfilled that. So we are not afraid of death. We should never be afraid of any person that say that they are a believer in Christ. And the fear of death is still present. It's still real in your life. You lack knowledge. Or you are in rebellion, refusing to believe what the scripture teaches. In Christ, you're not afraid of death. You welcome it when the time comes for your body to expire, if that is within the will of God. Because you will never taste, you will never taste death. If you notice, 
the scripture speaks of those who are in Christ. When they die, they sleep. They sleep. That's, that's the term that is used for believers. Those who have fallen asleep. <laughs> wow. So, I want us to really understand that if we are in Christ, thinking about the last days, it's not weird. It is agreeing with God. Because God could not have allowed this present world to continue forever. And he doesn't even want it to be a part of the foundation of what the new age will be. Because this has been tarnished. So he's going to wipe it out. And John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Hallelujah. So, we must allow that to be a part of our life, a part of our thought process. Because when you look and see what's going on in the world around you, if you don't believe that, you're going to be in fear. If you don't believe that, you're going to be in fear. You must be in fear. It's impossible for you to live above fear if you don't know God in this world. In this world. So as we come together today, another day, another time, this is not about a social gathering. We're happy. I, I, I hope I can say that for others. Um, we're happy. I'm happy to see you. But that's not why we come here. If it's about social gathering, then for heaven's sake, let us meet at some restaurant or the mall and go high shopping until your pocket gets involved. <laughs> but if we come in a setting like this, we must understand the purpose for which we come. Think about it. We're in a literal classroom, schoolroom. This is a, a, a college, right? When they have, uh, I think tomorrow morning, it's not a holiday, right? So tomorrow, sc school resume. When they have classes here and the student come, are they coming into the class to have a social time with the professor or the, what they have here, um, April, lecturer? Were you in this class? Yeah? Hmm. <laughs> yeah. When you came to class when you were a part of the, the school here, did you come to have a social time with the lecturer? No. And certainly, he or she is not in the class to have a social time with the, with the people. The person is coming in knowing that they're here to teach, to release whatever knowledge that they have paid the college for because the lecturer is being paid. So they're coming in knowing that they're here to deliver a, is it a product or service? It's a service. <laughs> it's a service that they're here to offer. And the persons that are coming in the class, they are expecting that those persons are here to receive that service because they paid for it. And if you come in the class and skylarking, they're not even going to trouble you because you're a big woman, a big man. They know that they're here to do their part and get their paycheck and gone. And if you want to pay your money to the college and come in here and skylark, it's your business. The time of us going to church to be entertained and to be pumped up and to love all the praise and worship singers sound, it's over. I will never be a part of it again. Never. Because it is not of God. And it's leading us to hell. And if we are serious about Christ, we need to change the way we think about what we call church. So let me give you a nugget. And the nugget, we're going to pray in a few minutes. It's about prayer. About prayer. 
And as I say to you that when we look at what we call the Our Father prayer, which is not, what, when we look at what we call the Lord's prayer, which is not, it is a framework. Framework. That's how we need to see it. Anybody inside here know anything about car enough to help me with this? That yesterday I used it as, a, as an um, example or an analogy or something like that. And the, the car has a framework, and that framework is known as a chassis. Which is the, what is the main part of the chassis? The, 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 the cross beams, that the, 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 it's in an eight shape because they have the part where the wheels are connected to that and then you have the axle running under there. I was trying to think what they call, what is it that they call that part? Because the other rest of the car is built on that. Do you know? Huh? Sub. You hear that? Me say, when you hear that? Hello, students. Did you hear that? Sub. Note, sub frame. Sub means to be under. Faith is the sub, sub substance. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Substance. I, I, I shouldn't be touching that yet. That is for later. All right. For years, I've been in the church now for 30, is what, 37, 38, 39. I, I stopped keeping check. I got born again in 1987. 1987. So I've been in the church for over 30 odd years. People listen to me. I have been a part of countless prayer meetings. I have been a part of prayer vigils. I have gone to prayer vigils in Kingston. We have prayer vigils in, in, in Port Antonio. We all, and hear this, even when I came here, I have, they took me, as a visiting preacher, I remember this ministry that I was, they took me to a prayer vigil. Then the first time I attended, if I if I think I think it's 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 my memory served me right there. The first time I attended a prayer breakfast, I think it was here in Canada. They had it at some place in in um, wherever it was. And when I went and I said, I said prayer prayer breakfast. And I'm convinced that the majority of the people that showed up at the prior breakfast, it wasn't about the prior. Because they had hacky and saltfish. They had, uh, they had callaloo. They had, they had scrambled eggs. They had a whole lot of stuff. So even while they're there doing the religious priors, their mind was not on God. And I'm saying all of that to say this for us to stop and think. Think about your own life. How often do you pray in power and with power? How often do you pray and engage the power of God? And that's supposed to be a norm for us once we're walking with Christ. It is not supposed to be an it and miss thing. Every time, whether you're standing, whether you're on the street or wherever... And you need to have a communication with God. Or God needs to communicate with you. It should be easy. It should be easy. Let me show you something that was happening during Jesus' time. And it was going on before Jesus came, of course. And... Um, when the children of Israel was brought out of Egypt, God established some things for them to come into in order for them to experience him live and direct, if I may use that term. Israel saw priests in Egypt that was 
um, assigned to their gods. So the main god for the Egyptians was Ra, the sun god. And there are many other gods that they worship. So they had the priests and so forth. So they would see certain rituals that they would perform and that they would do. Because the idea of the golden calf that Aaron built when Moses went up into the mount to receive the law from God and he spent 40 days and 40 nights, they said, as for this fellow, we do not know what have become of him. We need a God. They went to Aaron, the one who Moses left to oversee things until he returned. They said, make us a God. He was afraid of the people. A lot of leaders are afraid of you. Me? <laughs> make us a God. He, he, when Moses came down from the mount, you remember what he told Moses? Moses said, what is this that you have done? You have made the people naked. He said, oh, the people came to me and, you know, they told me whatever. And I threw the gold in the fire and the calf came out. That's exactly what the Bible says. How you throw gold in fire and calf come out? He had to carve it. <laughs> oh, I throw the gold in the fire and the calf does walk out. The idea of that, they saw it in Egypt. And God knew that if he didn't put certain things in place, they would practice the custom of what they saw in Egypt. I'm saying all of that to say this. Many of us say we're saved from how many years now? And we have been practicing the customs of religion, religious people around us, because many of us, we grew up even in a religious family. Granny's always praying loud in our bedroom. Singing every day around the house and in the kitchen. Oh, roll, jod, and roll. Roll, jod, and roll. I want to go to heaven, figure, sea, river, jod, and roll. And so you say, your granny was a Christian. And you say to me, your granny was a praying woman. Was that true? You hear her doing what you consider to be prior. But was she really getting heavenly results? And I know that some of you take great offense when anybody talk about your granny. I don't care about your granny. Because your granny is not the standard here. This is not about granny. Because when we... You know what? I made a statement about a week ago or two. I don't remember if, you, if any of you remember me making the statement that when we go to heaven, we will not remember. Not when we go to heaven. When the Lord return, we will not remember our loved ones. It created something in the internet world. People reaching out and saying, I hear you say this. Some person want me to give them scriptures. And I said, you see, we at the state of the church. I didn't even need to make that statement for you to know that that is going to be the reality. Why would you need to remember your family, your loved ones, when the Lord returned? What would be the purpose of it? And if you're going to be with him, wondering about your granny that didn't make it, your uncle that did, oh, that uncle was such a nice uncle, how come he's not here? <laughs> God says, shut up, no cry, no tears in heaven. And some of you feel bad about it. Well, walk away, cuss God and say, God, wicked, because how could you let me be there and don't remember my brother, my mother, my father? It shows you how we view God and the word of God. Jesus said, when the, when the it was the Sadducees, came to him to ask him about the resurrection. The Sadducees doesn't believe in the resurrection, nor angels, nor spirit. The Pharisees does. So the Sadducees who doesn't believe in the resurrection, you know that this is hypocrisy. Because they came and they said, Lord, we know of seven brothers. They all married this one woman. The woman outlived all of them. Wow, what a woman. 
<laughs> she outlived all the seven brothers, and then she died. The fifth brother should have learned and don't marry her. <laughs> you know, but, but anyway, she died. They said to Jesus, remember the question? In the resurrection, whose wife will she be seeing that she marry all seven brothers in this life? Jesus said, you're asking me this question because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God. He says, in Watch this, in the life to come, in the resurrection and the life to come. He said there will neither be given to married nor married. They will be like the angels who are in heaven. So if you're not going to be giving into marriage or married, it means that you will not even remember your husband that you were married to in this life. So my dear wifey, enjoy me now. <laughs> <laughs> Because over there, you won't even know. I'll pass by and you don't even remember nothing that this, this person was your husband or this person was your wife. Because God created certain things only for this life to show off things that are eternal. Why would we fight that? And thank God that that is going to be the reality. Because can you imagine you in, in that life and you worried about and I think about and I remember all these things. It would make the experience there sad. God said, no sadness around me. So do what you have to do in this life that is, that is only for this life. And get ready. For a wonderful life beyond this. No responsibility for children. <laughs> Don't you can't do that. Your children are inside here. But, but <laughs> That is where you say a quiet amen underneath your breath. <laughs> but I want us to really look at the scriptures for yourself. Don't only hear me talk about it here and then when you go, you leave it. Go back and look at it for yourself. And really get the revelation, the understanding of what I'm saying. Because I'm not making it up. Um... In 2004, January of 2004, I was in the British Virgin Islands. I was in, the, in Tartola, the capital of the British Virgin Islands. And it was a Wednesday, so I was on my personal time of fast. And I was reading the scriptures. And I remember that... But that moment, I was reading in the book of John, and I was reading chapter 4, and when I read it and finished, the Holy Spirit said, read it again. Read it again, finished. Said, read it again. Read it, finish. He said, read it again. And then I stopped, because when the Holy Spirit is telling you to do something again, it's not just for the sake of doing it again. There is something that he wants you to see and get. So I stopped. I said, what is it that you want me to see, Holy Spirit? And he began to show me something about worship that I had never seen before. And that's why you need to stop and think before you criticize me. I, I do not see worship the way I, many of you see it because of what God showed me. And I spoke about it, but not a lot of people receive it. What we call worship today is not worship. What we call praise and worship, it's not praise and worship. It's not in alignment with the biblical order of worship. Because in the scripture, don't take my word for it. If you are of God, take the time to look at the scripture. Nowhere from, from, from Old Testament to New Testament, the word worship has nothing to do with you standing. It has nothing to do with you clapping. It has nothing to do with you singing. It has to do with you bowing down. Bowing down. 
prostrating. So you see, even in the book of Matthew and Mark and Luke, when the woman with her daughter, the scripture said, when Jesus told her, say, I am not sent but to the last sheep of the house of Israel. And the scripture says she worship him. You know what that looked like? She was literally bowing down in front of him. In the book of Revelation, it says there is four, 24 elders around the throne. And notice the Bible said they bow down. They took off their golden crown and placed it before him in a bowing down before him. And they begin to now exclaim, holy, holy. Holy, and that in the original language, the word holy is spoken nine times, not three times as it is in our Bible now. It looked like whoever was doing the printing, they never, <laughs> either they run out of paper or page and did not put the nine, nine times, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Notice, bowing down before him. And that's the kind of worship we're going to be a part of in the world to come. This garbage that we call worship will not enter there. Because that doesn't exist in the kingdom. That is for entertainment's purposes. That the music is playing and you're jigging your body. And, and especially we, 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 um, <laughs> what you call we? We, there's something about us. Once music starts playing. <laughs> yes, my sister. Hmm? Trampoline dance, you call that? I don't know. Me just, uh... But we, we need to stop. We need to stop. We need to stop. When I give worship to God, true worship has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with how I feel or don't feel. True worship is focus on the king. Focus on the king. Who the king is and what is the purpose of me worshiping the king. Giving the king is worth. Because in worship, notice, it comes from the word worth, worthy. So you are appraising God as you get an appraisal to come in and appraise your property. Worship is that you are appraising God. What is his value? What is his worth? Not mine. And we sing song that we love, that we like, song that makes me feel good. Then who is the worship about now? I rest my case. In Matthew chapter 6, yesterday as I shared this little nugget, and as I said, I don't want to stay too long because it's supposed to be a nugget. But... As I shared from this passage, and I was talking about prior and the framework of it, and I made this statement in verse, um, in verse 5. He says, when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for, you, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the street. Note, they love to pray. Check the motive of your heart when you think about prayer, why you do it and why you want to do it. Is it that you're in love with prayer? Because you're not supposed to be in love with prayer. You give yourself to prayer for the purpose of what prayer is. Right? They love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corner of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward because if you want to be seen by men, by men, once they see you, you are rewarded. 
Verse 6, he said, but you, you who are in the kingdom, when you pray, go into your room. And as I said yesterday, this is, this is, this is for you to understand that it's about the motive that you're not going to be praying for somebody to see you. So he used the idea here of you going into a place where you're hidden from man seeing you. But it doesn't mean that we can't pray in public. It's the motive that you need to judge. Because Jesus himself prayed in public. Right? Am I right? He says, go into your room. One version says, go into your closet. And when you have shut your door... Pray to your father who is in the secret place. He who dwells in the secret place. Psalm 91 of the Most High God. What is the secret place? I'm not going to talk about that now. But he who is your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in the secret place will reward you. Not secretly, but openly, when you do it rightly. Verse 7, and when, you do, and when you pray, do not use, this is where I want to go, and then I'll just touch on the other thing and we pray. I said um, yesterday when I touched this, he said, do not use what? What is an important word that you need to pay attention to in that statement? vain. Jesus was not saying that you cannot repeat yourself where certain things is concerned, but it should not be. What would make your words vain? What would make you praying and your prayer is vain? Hmm? It's not in alignment with the word, right? Jesus gave a parable. Um, where is it? When he spoke about these two men that came up for prayer, he said one a publican and one a Pharisee. He said the Pharisees came up, he's praying, and he said, God, you see, I'm not like other men. What, what, what's, what's, what's going on here? You notice his word. You see, I'm not like other men. So what is he doing? He's comparing himself to others and lifting himself up above them. I am not like other men. I, I fast twice per week. I do this. I tithe. I do this. I do this. And God, Jesus says, and the publican simply didn't even lift his head up to heaven. He smote his breast and he said, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. Jesus said, which one of them left justified? Which one? He said, the Pharisees prayed with himself. That's what Jesus said. A lot of those prayers, even in this room, some of you, that's how you pray. He said the Pharisee prayed with himself. And he's justified in the eyes of men, but not in the sight of God. We cannot continue to play with prayer. If you're going to do it, as Mike Holmes says, do it right. Jesus said, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do. Why do they do it? Ask yourself the question, why do you do some things that you have been doing for years now and you call yourself Christian and you got church and somebody like me you don't like because you, you're looking for somebody to agree with your opinions. When you're in the kingdom, your opinion is garbage. It doesn't matter. It's the will of the king that matters. Not my will, Jesus says, but your will be done, Father. When are we going to get it that we're supposed to be in a kingdom? He said they think. The reason why they use vain repetition is because they think that they will be heard for their many words. For years ago, I began to check my prayer life. And I remember listening to 
I think at, at that time I used to listen to these guys, but <laughs> after a while I realized they were leading me astray. Benny Hinn, there, I think I heard Joyce Meyer made reference to him, and there's a few other preachers. He died, I think, during COVID 2020. South Korea, what they call the largest church in the world today, over a million people attend. They only have one gathering like this on a month. Um, Saturday, they have about, what, f four services once per month, and on the Sunday, they have about five because of the amount of people. He has 50,000 pastors around him, right? So I heard them saying, you know, and, and Benny in talking garbage and nonsense, but more prior, more power. Little prior, little power. Then he draw reference to Young Gichau, David, Dr. David Young Gichau, they call him. He, he's the, he was the leader and the founder of this church in South Korea. He pray two hours, two hours straight. Every morning, he wakes up and he goes into wherever he calls his prayer room and pray. he's not coming out until two hours later. I remember when I heard it the first time, I said, oh, so if I need a lot of power now, I should spend two hours. And what, two, uh, what, what, what kind of a power does two hours prayer produce? Seriously, I was trying it. I'm Brother Wes. After me did it, man, I'm here laboring, no Brother Wes. I'm laboring, and I'm laboring. I want me to look up on the clock. I don't know why I choose to look at the clock. Oh, when I look at the clock, my God Almighty, it's not even 20 minutes yet. And I'm saying, two hours. I can't do this. Because at that time, you're thinking that you have to be saying things and saying things. What am I going to be saying to God for two hours? And I found out that that standard was also wrong. If he choose to do that and whatever he experienced with God, it's not something that we should copy. We should follow the framework that Jesus Christ gave us. Not Dr. Yonggi Chow, not um, whatever, because a lot of us, we have prayer books from all over the place. We need to follow Jesus' instruction. Jesus said this now in verse 9. He said, in this manner, therefore, you should pray. So the framework, and brother, brother, brother Luke, you said the, the bottom piece of the, the chassis is called subframe. The subframe of the model prior is that's the foundation. Am I making it up? What is the first word of the model prior? Our. Our. Think about that. Think about that. Our. Which means Jesus is saying you are included in the family. My father is your father. Your father is my father. And what's the second word in the framework? That's the sub. If you continue after you hear me releasing this today, and what from however long I've been saying this for the last couple of days or so, if you continue to pray the way that you have been praying and ignore this, you will be no better than the Pharisee. Because you will be praying with yourself. And yourself cannot answer your prayer. We have not been building in this order. The time has come where we must dismantle, dismantle what we have been doing, and it has not been producing heavenly results, and rebuild it, rebuild it, rebuild it. You don't want to be driving in a car that the subframe is not 
intact. It can spell fatal. I think they're, they're, they're doing better now. But in the beginning, when Tesla started to mass produce the, the, model, the model S, I think, that was the first before they had the Model Y and so on. And uh, there is this gentleman that he, that's what he does. That's what his business is about. So he literally went out and bought one of the Tesla for over 100,000 US dollars. That's how expensive they are. And he brought it into his place because this is what, and he tear it down. And when he tore it down, he found out that the chassis was compromised because of the rush to produce the vehicles, the chassis was not being properly done. And he exposed it. And as a result of that, it, it had, it, it had kind of caused a little damper. But then they started to do things properly. You don't want to be in a car driving on the 401 at 120 kilometers per hour and the chassis is not intact. It's not cartoon world where the car come off the wheel and the see the cartoon man still a sliding at the other part of the car or go over the other side. This is not cartoon. <laughs> it's not going to work like that. We need to make sure that from this point on, if you have not been doing it, stop praying. Cancel your prayer right now and begin to go back from the foundation and look at this and say, God, I ought to know you as father and I don't. Reveal yourself to me as father. Stand with me, please. I was thinking about it this morning. Why is it that the devil is fighting this message so much? Because why we would even struggle to come into it it's not just natural. It's not normal. There's a devil. There's an enemy that is objective is for you not to know God as Father. And there is a purposeful reason why. Father, for those that are in this room right now, you know who are of you. You know those who are serious about you. I cannot see their heart unless you reveal it, but you know. I pray, Father, that for those who are hoping to receive the truth of your word, that even before we pray together, there will be a revelation. Father, allow their spirit, allow their spirit, my God, because it's your spirit that will make that clear to us. As you did with Peter when your son asked him, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And you gave Peter the revelation. You are that God in this room there are those of us that need that revelation for ourselves. We don't need to hear somebody say it. We need to hear it from you. We need to experience it flowing from you. Do it, Father. Do it. That from this day forward, from the seventh day of April moving forward, we, our prayer life will never remain the same. Our entire life will take on a different form to it because we have gotten a revelation that you are Father. So now, I want us to go ahead and begin to engage the Father corporately. Go ahead and talk to him. While we're in this room, pray into that. Pray for each other. The scripture tells us to pray one for another. The Holy Spirit will also may, may, may lead you to pray in a specific way for a particular individual. Then go ahead and do that. 
continue to give God thanks for the ministry in Jamaica. The people that are there and whatever God is doing and God wants to do and will do, they will come into it. Pray for those that have come to be a part of our family online. Those in Africa, those in, in Asia, in, 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 in Australia, in the Americas. Pray for them that they will continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for this moment. Thank you for this privilege. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this moment and this time that you have given to us. To come together as the body of Christ. This Father is not about entertainment. It's not about a social gathering. It's, it's, there's something bigger. There's something deeper. There's something higher. And Father, as we come, we, we, we want to give ourselves to the true divine order. Father, for, for, for so long, many of us have been building without a proper framework. Father, we know that even in this natural world around us, there are people who go and build buildings and build things, and it's not built according to code, and later on it costs even debt. And my God, help us to understand that you have a pattern. We're not just called to do things as we think or as we feel. There is a pattern. You gave Moses a pattern for the tabernacle. You gave David a pattern for the temple. Oh my God, you have been given patterns after patterns throughout the world. And we, your people, in the kingdom of God today, you have given us a pattern of how we should pray. There's a pattern for how we give. There's a pattern for how we fast. There's a pattern for how we live our life. And Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Because Christ is the pattern. Christ is the pattern. He's the pattern, son. He's the model, son. Oh, Father, I pray that as we come together in this room and those that are watching online from around the world... I thank you, Lord, for their lives. I thank you for what you're doing in their life through this medium. And, Father, I pray that they will come each time knowing that once they turn on, once they sign on, once they come in, that the only thing that they will be experiencing is what is of the truth, is what is of God, is what is real, is what, it's what it, there is nothing of religion, there's nothing that is of man, there's nothing that is of the flesh, because no flesh ought to glory in your presence, only your spirit. And so, Father, we're here today opening ourselves, opening ourselves, opening our plans, opening up our decisions, opening our lives to the guidance of your spirit. Because your word tells us in Romans chapter 8 that as many as are led by your spirit, it is a sign that they are legitimate sons of God. So, Father, may we, may we really take the time to open ourselves up to your Spirit. May we receive your Spirit. May we give ourselves to be led by your Spirit. Because, Father, without your Spirit, we cannot, we cannot, we cannot build according to the pattern that you have given to us. Because it has been given to us through your Spirit. It has been given to us through your spirit. And so, Father, I pray that we will hear what the spirit is saying to the church. We will hear what the spirit is saying to the church. And, Father, as, I, as you have been guiding me to give these nuggets about prior and allowing you people, for some of us, it's the first time in our life we're hearing something like this. And Father, there is a spirit, there is something that is behind the scene wanting some to quickly ignore it and say, I don't believe that. I don't think that is so. But Father, may they be like the Bereans, that they will go and look at the scriptures for themselves. Because whatever I say, your word begin to come alive to support it. Once it is from you, your word begins to come alive from all over the scriptures to support it, to support it, to support it. Because your spirit has been sent to guide us into all truth. So the Holy Spirit will never support anything that is a lie. He will never, ever support anything that is a lie. Father, may we honor you with our thinking. May we honor you with our speech. May we honor you with our life. May we honor you, Father. 
May we honor you. May we honor you as you ought. Because you are worthy. You are deserving of such. So, Father, as we come together in this room and as people come together around their television in different places, I pray that the Holy Spirit, like a blanket, his presence will cover us in this room. His presence will cover those in their living room, in their kitchen, in their bedroom, their bathroom, wherever they're watching from. They will experience the tangible, the tangible manifestation of the Spirit, His presence. Because, Father, whatever you have assigned Him to do for on this day, it is the will of heaven that we come into certain things this day. Not tomorrow, not yesterday. But this day, give us this day our daily bread. So whatever the daily bread is, Father, may we take a bite out of it. May we break it. May we, may we eat of it. And when we eat of that bread, we know that it gives us life, 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 life. So, Father, thank you for hearing and thank you for answering and thank you for granting it. In the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen and amen. Amen. Be seated if you can, please. Sister Tricia, I'm going to ask you to come and read. And you know what you're going to read? Nope, you ain't going to touch two. I want you to go back to chapter one. I want you to go back to chapter one. We started reading the book of Revelation yesterday. It's one of those scary books of the Bible that a lot of believers never touch. Because they believe that when they go around there, they're going to meet up some seven-head <laughs> monsters and stuff that has been told to us in Sunday school and by preachers who are dumb to what God is about. But I want you to s understand this. As I said yesterday, there are certain things that you must understand about the book of Revelation in order for you to... Um, would I use the word decipher? or whatever word you want to think of. But for us to unlock it, there is a code. And as a matter of fact, the entire Bible is closed. It's closed. And not because you have one and because you can read means you understand what you're reading. And that's why God anoint persons and put them in offices that is called apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and notice, teacher. For the teacher to explain what has been encrypted and hidden from the world for his people to come into it. It is not hidden from us. It is hidden for us. Right? And I've seen people that are fascinated with the book of Revelation. People are literally, you see, just like oh, even tomorrow, I don't know why this is happening. Why is it that they... Even the police, they are literally scared about what is going to happen in Niagara tomorrow. Because they said, oh, no, they're going to angle the crowd. Why, why is people so fascinated with this eclipse? Why? What is the phenomenon, phenomenon about it? Same thing with Revelation. A lot of people who even do read it, they don't read it for the understanding of it. They are fascinated about the things that are there. We need to understand it because it holds things for us as the church, for how we as the church ought to be, watch this, positioned and how we must continue doing the tribulation. Because whether you want to believe me or not, mark it down today. For many of you that were here yesterday and some of us that were watching, and there are people who weren't watching the Saturday meeting, the fasting meeting, and they weren't here yesterday. I want to say it again today. Mark it down. Write it down in your phone or any way you want to write it. There will be no rapture of the church. If you think that I'm dumb, watch and see who is going to be the dumb preacher. Al Janegi that have been telling people about rapture, there will be no rapture. 
he might soon dead because he's now what? In his 80s. So he might soon die. But there will be no rapture. The, one of the things that the book of Revelation holds for us, Trisha, it allows us chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. Holds the key for how the church is supposed to be living during the tribulation. But we don't care because we're waiting on rapture. Scotty is dead. You will not be beamed up. So listen to me now. We're going to approach this book with an open mind. We're going to, we're going to release everything that we had we, about it before. And let us hear what the Spirit wrote how many years ago to the church. Hear it the way the Spirit wants you to. Chapter 1. Sorry. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads mm -hmm. and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. Wow. And has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Hmm. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom hmm. and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God mm -hmm. and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Theatira, mm -hmm. to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Wow. wow. He had in his, sight, his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance like the sun shining in its strength. Wow. And when I saw him... Mm. I fell at his feet as dead. 
But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid. Mm. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Mm. I have the keys of Hades and of death. <laughs> mm -hmm. Ooh. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are mm. the seven churches. Yes. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Tempted, but I'm not going to yield to the temptation. <laughs> I, I am going to leave this because I know I will need to literally teach on this book. Not to satisfy our fancy, our obsession, but for truth. Truth to comfort that will prepare us, that will prepare us to be and not reacting during the time of the system of the beast. I truly believe with all of my heart the framework is already there. And it's not now that it's there. Because John in 1 John chapter 2, he said, little children, you have heard that Antichrist will come. He said, the spirit of the Antichrist is already gone out into the world. The framework is there. And so what is going to happen in these last days, it's going to take on the full form of what it is meant to do. And it's not new. The whole thing with the Antichrist is not new. It started in the garden. What will happen in Revelation is that God allowing it to run its course and it comes to an end. And many people treat the book of Revelation as if it stands alone. Another thing that I want you to take note of as you read through the book of Revelation, you see it ties into scriptures that preceded it. And it's rightly placed exactly where it ought to be. Because it's showing you how Christ came in time and accomplished everything that the Father wants done and finish it. It doesn't stand by itself. And we need to be careful how we're interpreting things when we read it. That's all I will say until then. We have a prayer request from online. Marie, Marie in Brooklyn, New York, has two surgeries on her right shoulder, right shoulder, a pending spine, spinal cord surgery. Wow. And sit and know why you hit this woman so. Acting, asking for prayer in healing. Now, Marie. I am going to come in agreement with you that God will restore from the two surgeries that you have had on your shoulder. I know that it has left problems. There are side effects from that surgery, from those two surgeries. And I am going to come in agreement with you. I have prayed for many persons with spine problems and see God instantly heal them. I want you to agree with me, please. I don't know if there's anyone present where you are. Maybe you're in your room or wherever you are. If there's another person in that room that is a believer in Christ, 
In the moment that I'm praying, I'm going to ask them to lay their hands on you. There is a prayer request that we have from uh, Grandma in Guyana. So the brethren in Guyana, you're watching right now. Because when I spoke to Grandma this morning, she said she was getting ready to go to the house where they were all going together around the television to watch. So we're praying for Jamal Holligan. And that condition that the doctor says with your brain, that there is something where the brain is concerned, like there is a tearing in one of the, something with the brain and there is a bleeding, so he has been experiencing terrible headache as a result of that. Jamal, today, the 7th of April, I am believing God that God is going to re- a line, and that thing is going to be completely made whole, that you will have no problem from this day forward. And anybody else that is watching, and you have any sickness or disease in your body, and you will agree with me, you will come in agreement with me. I am not the healer. I am simply a vessel that, I'm, that is going to give God permission to release his healing virtue to your body. I want you to agree with me today, that the living God is a healing God. He's a God who continues to work miracles. And what is impossible to human doctors or even spiritual doctors, it is not impossible to God. There's a young lady also in Jamaica, Jasmine. I don't know if you're watching Jasmine. You had a broken leg or something. And for a long time now, they put the leg in that cast or whatever, and then you went back to the doctor, and they have found out that there is absolutely no change. There is, the bones didn't heal. Nothing has changed. I want you to agree with me today that God is going to heal your bones, restore it completely, and tissue and whatever has been damaged is going to be restored. Father, I thank you that you are the living God. I thank you that you are the God of heaven. You are eternal. Your throne is in the heaven. You reign, you rule in the kingdoms of men. There is nothing impossible or too hard for you. And so, Father, I come in agreement with some persons in this room. For persons that are watching right now, there, there might be those in this room that are sick. And Father, I come in agreement right now with them that whatever it is, I know that it is not beyond your authority. It is not outside of your ability to do what needs to be done. Because you are the God with whom nothing shall be impossible. So right now in the name of Jesus, I take authority over the spirit of infirmity. I take authority over the spirit of bondage. I take authority over the spirit of oppression that have been oppressing Marie's body and caused her to experience two surgeries on her shoulders already. And Father, there is a pending surgery for spinal cord. Right now in the name of Jesus, spirit of oppression, spirit of infirmity, let Marie's body go. Brooklyn, New York. I send the word, Lord. I send the word. I send the word to your shoulder. I send the word to your shoulder, Marie. I command in the name of Jesus, nerve endings, vein, tissue, whatever has been affected to be made hold right now. I speak to your spine. I speak to your spine. I speak to your spine. Come here. Come here. Let me use you to do something. Marie, I'm going to use Brianna for you right now. I want you to agree with me. God does demonstration throughout the scriptures, Old and New Testament. Paul and Kerchief and Apron left his body to heal the sick. As I lay my hands on Brianna's back, right at her spine, Marie, I speak to your spine, and I command your spine to line up and come in order. Be healed. Vertebrae's disc. In the name of the Lord Jesus the Christ, ah, Father, as the anointing flows upon you, we send it to New York. We send it to Brooklyn. Marie, 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 I command your spine to line up with the word, line up with the spirit, line up with the anointing. 
vertebrae and this come in order. Father, thank you. And Father, we're declaring and decreeing that that, that surgery, that pending surgery is canceled. Glorify your name, Father, in this situation. Father, thank you for touching Jasmine leg. In Jamaica, I command the bones to be restored. I command tissue and everything to be healed. I send the word to Jamaica. And Father, we send the word to Jamal in Guyana. Father, thank you for restoring that thing that the doctor says has breached. Some breach has taken place and there is a slight bleeding in the brain. Father, thank you that you are the one who created the brain. Doctor, after study to know the brain, you created the brain. So, Father, right now I thank you for a recreative miracle where Jamal is concerned in the name of Jesus. In Guyana, Father, not, there's a lot of Jamals around the world. But, Father, the Jamal in Guyana, in that room right now that is watching, I release the word to you and I command your brain, I command you to be healed. And the pain is going because once God healed the brain, healed that part of the brain, there will be no more pain. Father, thank you. For anyone else that is watching and there's a sickness or a disease, this is not gimmickry. This is not because I want people to see me. But Father, I want them to see you. You are a healing God. You are a healing God. You demonstrated it through your son. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Who went about doing good. Healing all who were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. It is God's will for us to be healed. Let me say that again. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about, listen, doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. So it was God that was doing it through him. So it is the will of God for you to be healed. It's the will of God for you to be healed from every oppression of the devil. It's the will of God. So, Father, thank you for your healing virtue flowing. Father, thank you for healing Sister Hamilton, restoring her vigor, restoring her vitality, restoring, Father, her health, her body. She is yours. She is property of heaven. And so, Father, we command the devil to take his hands off her. And, Father, thank you for healing Sister Bev Smith. Father, thank you that you who have begun a good work in her body, you will complete it. You will complete it. Thank you for brand new kidneys, brand new kidneys, brand new kidneys. None of your people, none of your children should ever be going to no dialysis. And have them a, have machine and take out them blood and put in back them blood and take out them blood and put in back them blood. None of your pitney, none of your pitney supposed to be going through that. So right now, Father, I thank you for brand new, brand new kidneys. Brand new kidneys. Brand new kidneys. Anybody else that is having kidney problem, Father, I release the word to them right now. I don't care what percentage the doctor say your kidney is. Father, thank you for restoring and manifesting your mighty power and glorifying your name. In Christ's name I pray and tell you thanks. Amen. 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 Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glorify your name. Glorify your name. Glorify your name. Glorify your name. Hey. It's really good to be here today. And it's good to see all of you that are here. And it's not good for me to be here because of, you know, the crowd and I want to be seen. But because of the things of God. Many, many are the plans, the thoughts in a man's mind, but it's the purpose of God that shall stand. Only the purpose of God will be of any value or of any worth. Anything that we plan apart from God, we have no guarantee that it's going to succeed. And even if it does succeed, it will not end well because when you are doing anything apart from God present at the very foundation of that thing is corruption and that's why even in the book of Proverbs it says in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct or shall direct your part. God will never direct you in corruption. God will never direct you in failure. <laughs> never. Never. So it's important for us to think and receive and give ourselves to that truth as people of God. Don't just do things for the sake of doing. Do it with God. And if God is not doing it, abandon it. It has been a couple of weeks now we haven't taken the time to recognize our first time visitors based upon how the Holy Spirit has been leading. So I think I have a little bit of a freedom to do it today. So those of you that are visiting with us for the very first time, if you're here for the first time, can we recognize you and give you a welcome hug? Just stand for a... Okay. Anyone else? And your face looks so familiar, like it's, <laughs> you weren't a first-time visitor. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, so you were the first to stand. What's your first name? My name is Yashika. Yashika. Oh, wow. I like it, that name. And you were the second? Javani. Okay. Um, and over here, your first name? Simone? Dante? And Gracie? <laughs> How are you, Gracie? Nice to meet you. I didn't miss anybody? Huh? No, I got Giovanni. Oh, up at the top. Hi. Your first name?
Nadine is the person you <laughs> Z, Z Zulika. Wow. Oh. Her name is a little more expensive than yours. <laughs> I'm going to ask someone from the ministry, not the person that invited you, the, someone else, three, four, five of you, give them a welcome hug, put your hands together, and welcome them. It's good to have you. And after you get your hugs, you can take your seats. Good to have you, good to have you. Reminders, um, one, our um, which one is close? The baptism? Is it? There is a baptism in May the 18th. There is something in Montreal and April. Which one is closer? <laughs> um, so our baptism coming up on the 18th of May, 2024. Looking forward to it just like I do with the others. Um, but, but there's something unique about this one. Um, we have persons coming over from the States, of course. We have persons coming from Jamaica. We have persons coming from other parts of the world to be baptized, and we are going to get to meet some people that have been a part of the ministry online for a long time, and they believe that they need to be baptized, and you should believe that you want, you'd need to be baptized. And there are those of you that have been watching, or you become a part of the ministry, and you have not been baptized. Water baptism plays an important role in your walk with Christ. I'm not making it up. It's in the scripture. That's why I even did two teachings already. What qualifies you for water baptism? And I'm showing you what the scripture says about that. So we have our baptismal forms here. So even for persons in this room, we don't know what the Spirit is saying to you, what the Spirit is doing we have them here, so you fill it out, get it back to me. If you can't reach me because of some reason, you know, in the moment, you can put it in one of the baskets, that one here, one up there, all right? The second thing is our um, July, what you call it? Barbecue. Royal gathering, all right? It's in July, and um, it's the last Saturday in July. Um, mm, I'm looking forward to it too. Time is. You think we will be safe? <laughs> <laughs> Because we entered into spring and we, I cleaned snow twice. I don't know where you live, but where I lived, I cleaned snow twice, just a few days ago. And I said, it's spring. So I am outside in my shorts and even Emmanuel saying, <laughs> when my wife said, I don't know how you, you're outside in shorts here, Emmanuel. I have been wondering the same thing too. <laughs> <laughs> and I have on my jacket up here, right? And shorts down here and, you know. And I said, a part of me is submitting and a part of me is rebelling. Because I am not giving in to winter taking over spring. It's supposed to be nice spring. You know, you hear the birds singing and you're enjoying the fresh air. And preparing for spring cleaning. But anyway, again, signs of the times are here. So don't be surprised if 
that Saturday in July. I did not say anything, you know. I just, I just said, don't be surprised. <laughs> now, that time we will prove to see if you're really engaging heaven when you pray. <laughs> okay? But I want to thank God for those of you who are a part of the planning of such and those of you that will come together to work together to make it what. It was, I believe that we would exp we'll have a, a, even a greater experience this year than we did last year. So I want to thank you even in advance for your voluntary, you know, whatever it is that you will give to be a part of making it work the way that it ought. Amen? And then... I want to say something about Montreal, Montreal. Um, I made the announcement about it a couple of Sundays ago, and remember at the ending of it, I emphasized, I said, I want you to keep it in prayer. I, I know that some of you will be there, and I really appreciate your coming to, you know, support and be a part of what the Spirit will be doing in that moment. But it needs to be prayerful. Don't come because you have not left Ontario for a while now. It is not that kind of a gathering. When we come back, we can go to the DR or to Punta Cana. But this is about God looking for a people, being in a spot where the open windows of heaven or the doors of heaven can pour out. Because in order for the tangible presence of God to be experienced in a place, somebody, somebody has to be there. Jesus was in a place, the scripture said, like this room teaching, and the power of the Lord was present to heal. Right? So I want you to continue to keep it in prayer. How, how about another two weeks or so we have to go? Continue to keep it in prayer. And we believe in God that when we show up, it is going to interrupt Quebec. Is that the, how you pronounce it? It's going to interrupt things in that region. Because we're not just going for the sake of going. We are carriers of something. For the young people, because they're, they're the ones who are planning it, and they ask me to come and facilitate what they have seen or gotten from the Spirit. And it is mostly geared towards their young people. So the Friday night, Saturday night, um, I think... Um, based on how the schedule that they sent to us, it's the Saturday, two sessions on Saturday. One of the sessions will be question and answer session. So they want me to be in a position where these young people will question, you know, whatever question they have in regards to their walk with Christ, that I will be able to help them to further strengthen their walk. Because I've been there before, the, 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 the wife said to me, she said, we saw the impact that you had when you came here the first time, especially on our children, on our children. So she said, when I saw what the Spirit is doing at this moment, she said, I would not trust these people to anybody else but you. And I honor God for that. I honor God for that. Keep it in prayer, all right? And whatever plans we're putting in place, we need to get it in time for whatever, but we're going, right? About five are you going? <laughs> About five are you going? Excuse me, what? 
You're looking like, no, no, you're not, make, you're not going with me? Yes. Oh, you're going with me, all right. So, Father, right now, as I talk about it, we're not just going to leave it because we might even walk out and forget it. Montreal, Father, Montreal, Montreal, Montreal. Father, it has a reputation to it. Father, there are certain spirits that is over Montreal, Montreal. Father, as a matter of fact, there are certain spirits over the province of Quebec. And God, as we go, I believe, Lord, even as in the book of Acts, when Philip went to Samaria, and the Bible told us that Simon the sorcerer had bewitched the city. Father, but when Philip went and preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, the rich cross spirit was broken. Father, I am believing you that as we go, my God, the very moment we enter into the territory, the very moment our presence show up, even before we open our mouth, Father, spirits will begin to be dismantled and things will begin to be torn down and your kingdom, your kingdom, Father, your kingdom, your kingdom will be established and advanced in that province. And Father, I decree and declare that it is so in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you, Lord, for preparing the hearts of the people to receive what you will dispense through me in the name of your son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Continue to keep it in prayer. Continue to keep it in prayer. I'm believing God for something. Let me also say this before I start teaching because maybe when I get there I might not have a chance to say it. I said it yesterday, and I thought that when I was saying it, the, the streaming had stopped. When I got home, my wife said, some, I said, you heard that? I thought, I, said, I thought when I was saying that, they weren't streaming. We are not going to continue doing certain things that we have been doing for a while now where here is concerned. And even though they do not say anything, they don't trouble us, they give us grace, and a lot of grace. A lot of grace. Because based on the contract, we're supposed to be here on Sunday from 10 to 2. And some Sundays, don't want the administration and the person for here, but... <laughs> But some Sundays we leave your. Even when I'm leaving, I leave a lot of you here. We need to behave in a way that exemplifies the kingdom that we're representing. So, we're not going to continue to do those long hours after because it's not our place and if 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 it was not if it if, if it wasn't a case where they have a security person that shows up because we're here and i'm thinking about these persons it's not the same person that come all the time there's one lady out there she doesn't mind because you know there was one sunday i remember saying and she said oh no not at all but there are others and we don't know where their thinking are or whatever, let us work in a way that does not allow them to be offended or think any way that they should not. Am I right? So on Saturdays, we're here from 8 to 12, Sunday, 10 to 2. So after you finish on the meet and greet, Clear the foyer. Do not go out there and pitch tent. 
Because the security is not going to leave until you leave the building. As long as Elvis is in the building, the security is going to stay there. So, we need to take these things in consideration and do not continue to take things for granted. How me sound? <laughs> Hmm? A little while? Oh, they had a parking lot. Of course, you're okay. Of course. You can stand the parking lot. They're not going to charge you because, you know, you're not parking, your, your whatever, whatever, because you're parking stuff. I think it goes until for the whole day, right? The $6 cover the whole day. So, yeah, you can stand the parking lot. The security doesn't care about you out there. <laughs> you can stay out there. And it's summer now. So we can hang out and barbecue <laughs> and do some stuff out there. But where the property is concerned, the, the building, they will stay until we leave before they can do whatever they have to do. So we're going to change that. Um, this is now the... I think, what, the ninth installment of this teaching? Not that it, it matters. But I want you to hear me today for a few minutes more like you have never heard me before. Last week... Let me remove this. I want you to go on another journey with me where this teaching is concerned. I don't teach and preach the word for feedbacks. But people do give feedback from time to time. Not that I am looking for it. And I've heard so many persons who say that they are grateful to God for this teaching on faith. You know why... Many of us, even our prayer life is a mess because faith is out of order. Because where your prayer is concerned, faith is important to praying. Am I right? In Mark, there is Matthew chapter 17 also, and there is Luke. But in Mark chapter 11, Jesus, going back and forth, teaching in the temple in the day, and then in the evening, he would leave the temple and go somewhere with the disciples, sleep and do whatever, and then in the morning, he would come back. And he did that for a few days, consecutively, leading up to the time of him dying on the cross. And the scripture told us that one of the evening when he was leaving Jerusalem, leaving the temple to go wherever he was going to stay, he saw a fig tree. And the Bible said it was not the time of fig. And he went over to the fig tree. And when he went over to the fig tree, the scripture says there's no fig on it because it's not the time of fig. So didn't he know that it wasn't the time of fig for fig? Do, doesn't he? Right? So why, did, why would he even do what he did? It was to display something concerning about faith for the disciples. It wasn't for his sake. The Bible said he spoke to the fig tree and said to it, From this day forward, let no fruit, no fruit. And the scripture said, 
he went on. The disciples was here hearing. They saw when he went over. They heard when he spoke. And they're not, they're not even paying much attention to it. They're just saying, oh, Jesus is doing his jesus thing. You know, he's always doing jesus thing. So it's one of those jesus thing. But then they're coming back the following morning. And what they were not paying attention to the evening, they stopped. You remember why? Peter said, Lord, look, the fig tree that you cursed yesterday is perfectly dried up. Perfectly dried up. What did they say? It dried up from what? So when something dry up from the root, it's dead. <laughs> I want you to see this. Pastor, what are you talking about? It's connected to faith. It's connected to faith. Jesus turned and said to them, when they said to him, Lord, look, the fig tree that you curse is dried up. Dried up from the root. Dead. Will never live again. Because what did he say? What did he say the evening before? Let no fruit. And notice the tree heard him, Sister Jackie. And the tree, unlike a lot of us who say we love God, the tree obeyed him. <laughs> the tree obeyed the instruction that was given. I, it, it bothers me. My heart is burdened every day when I look at people all over the world and in front of me who say, I love God, but yet there is absolutely no commitment to obey God. You cannot represent God without obedience. Or oh, you think Abraham became the father of our faith? Obedience. God said to him, and God said it not for his God's sake, but for Abraham's sake. God said, now that I know that you fear me, in blessing I am going to bless you. And in multiplying, I am going to multiply you. God reward is obedience. God hate disobedience. Disobedience is worse than the sin of witchcraft. And you cannot run around saying you love God and never obey him. If I wasn't obeying him, I wouldn't be standing here. Jesus said, not only, and I believe, Wherever he was standing, he was pointing, literally sister came pointing to the mountain. He said, not only will you do this, that which was done to the fig tree. Eh -eh. Not only will you do this. Are you getting it? Marcel, are you getting it? Jesus is saying, you and I, when we have faith in God, we can do the same. There are some things in your life that you can, you can curse it to the root. It doesn't have to continue to exist. Why is it that we come to God, we say, and we do not believe that we can be healed? Why is it that we come to God, we say, and we do not believe that we can be delivered from, the, from whatever cycle that has been plaguing our family and it continues to operate in life and you're jumping, shouting, bawling, crying, and do not believe that you can be free? What is the sense? What is the purpose? Go back. Go back in a sin if you are going to walk with God and still remain the same. It not make no sense, much less to make faith. Coming to God means that there must be a difference. Why did you leave your country? Those of you that migrated to come to Canada. Why did you leave your country to come here? You remember why? You came looking for, oh, you don't want to talk. You came looking for a better life. What would have happened if you came? And of course, some of you come in the better life that you're looking for. I don't know if it's in Quebec. I don't know if it's in Nunavut or wherever it is, but some of us have not even found it yet. But now that you're in the kingdom of God, stop going to geographical location to look for a better life because that better life is in the kingdom. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is Canada.
I'm not asking you. There are people who left their country coming, come, go to come to a country like this for a better life, and it got worse to death. Some of them are dead right now and never discover any better life. I have heard persons even on the news saying, oh, you know, my father left thinking, and what? Leaving a war zone country and come to Canada to get shot at Batters and Sinclair. You think that you're safe in Canada without God? You think you're safe in Brampton? A couple days ago, one lesson, on somebody road, Mississauga Road, a body was found on a porch with gunshot, right? It's gunshot, they say, in Brampton. You think you're safe in Mississauga? You think you're safe anywhere in Canada? I've, I've seen some crime that has taken place in some places here. And people say, oh, I've been living here for 20 years. And nothing like this has ever happened. Time has changed. The heart of men is becoming more desperately wicked. Crimes that used to be committed in the night. Broad daylight. In front of police. I do not trust the country of Canada to be my source, my source, or my protection. The prime minister, wherever he's going, he's guarded by the Har C MP because he's federal. The premier of Ontario, when he's going anywhere, he's guarded by the OPP because he's provincial. The mayor, when he or she is going anywhere, they're guarded by the municipal police. And guess what? Their security is always compromised. Because, listen, I always say, who secured the security? <laughs> and it's a man. The Bible says, the Bible said, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. President of the United States of America is the most, the most guarded person in the world today. Yet, me say, yet, he's still not secure. But God. Marcella, 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 I am saying to you today as your pastor, not as your friend, not as your body, but as your pastor, as a man of God, whatever it is in your life that is not of God, it can be dried up from the root. God don't limb things. God don't cut down limbs. God don't cut down tree because if you cut down the tree in the book of Job, he said there is hope that it might spring again at the scent of water. It can come back. So when God has deal with some things in your life, God kill it from the root. He shook the prison in the book of Acts. Remember what the Bible said? The foundation of the prison. Hoo, hoo, hoo. 
Because when strong men, which are demonic spirits, come into your life, they build strongholds. So it's, it's on a foundation, a foundation of lies. When God is setting you free, God destroy foundations. God kill root. How dare you come to faith in Christ, you say, and still continue to believe that you're supposed to live the way you were living in sin. Still sicky, sicky. Still in bondage. If, no, you, this today, you're in a dark room, a ball. Tomorrow you come, oh, thank God, I'm too blessed to be stressed. And then next week, you're a ball again. Your balling day is supposed to be over. That if you're going to ball, it must be balling for joy, but not balling for sorrow, pain and heartache and bondage and brokenness come unto me all ye that are labored and are heavy laden the promises that I will give you no I will give you more burdens Jesus said I am come no he said first the thief is coming and the thief comes with this objective to steal, kill, and destroy. But, somebody say but. but. Somebody say but. but. Somebody say but. but. Say but again. But. I am come. You, no, no, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Notice, you know, notice Jesus' argument. Notice his statement. You notice he said, the thief come not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. And he didn't leave it at that. He said, but. You, you, when Jesus said, but, you know what happened? Kingsley, when Jesus said, but, you know what happened? When God said, but, you know what happened? But I am come that you might have what? Life and have it more. Where is sickness and disease and bondage and pain and heartache and brokenness in there? It's what we believe. And I pray to God that you're paying attention to this faith teaching. Because a lot of you keep on saying, oh, I believe God. I be Prove it. James says, show me your faith without works. And I'm going to show you my faith with works. You say you believe God. Prove it. Because when you believe God, when you believe in the living God, there is certain fruits that is supposed to come forth from your life that testify for you. That even when you don't open your mouth, there is certain manifestation that is telling a story. Can any of you in this room that have known me for at least a week or two, can you, can you, can you, can you see me before God save me? It's hard for you because you have never, you weren't there, you didn't see it, so you don't have no point of reference. You met me after he delivered me. But I wasn't born like this. This was not what my life was for 18 years. And you know what I believe? Some of you do not believe me. You do not believe that I was a shy person suffering from serious low self-esteem. You do not believe that. Just like how when some people testify and they tell you how they were a chain smoker or they were such and such and they did such and such and you say, what? I don't believe that. But every single person that comes to faith in God is coming from somewhere and wherever they're coming from was dark. The only difference is that some of us, the darkness was a little darker. But we're all coming from darkness because we're, we were translated from the powers of darkness and brought into the kingdom of the son of his love. 
So don't just look at me and think that I don't have a testimony or have a story. We're all coming from somewhere. But the problem that I'm seeing today and that I have with many, we still continue in certain bandage after we come in and accept it. Because if you tolerate it, you will never be healed. Not even God can heal you if you tolerate it. You think I make up stuff? Why would Jesus ask the blind man after the blind man was brought to him? Why would Jesus ask him, what do you want me to do for you? He's blind. And in Bible days, today, blind people, they, 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 they have a, a cane or something for you to see. From the moment you see them, you know that they're blind. In Bible days, it was a clothing. It was a clothing that you would know that the person is blind. That's why when blind Bartimaeus got healed, before he even received insight, the Bible said he took off. He took off the outer garment. Come on, it's there in the scripture. You know what the outer garment was? It was the garment that identified him as a blind man. He said, today, when I go to Jesus, that identity is canceled. The Bible said, Sister Kim, the Bible said when he got ill, he followed Jesus in the way. The Bible said when he got ill, he followed Jesus in the way. Are you getting it? He was blind. So if he must follow Jesus now, and Jesus not holding his hand and leading him, he's seeing. That's why you testify and say, once I was blind, but now I can see. Stop misrepresenting God and stop making people think that God is our impotent God. When you come to God, whatever it is that was plaguing you before, God curse it at the root and you need to agree with him. Hebrews chapter 11 says, by faith, Rahab the harlot. <laughs> They'll get it later. Let me come down here. So. By faith, Rahab the harlot. <laughs> are, are you getting it? Yes. She hid the spies. And by doing that, so what you say now, after that, she wasn't an harlot anymore. Because if you read the story, because she hid the spies, a promise was made to her that your house, your family will not be touched. And Joshua said, make sure, tell her, make sure you're in your house when God is doing what he's doing. And he says, if anybody of your family that want to be saved, make sure they come into your house and tie a piece of red, red, a piece of red, red, it represents the blood. Tie a piece of red rope. Hang it out at the window because when I see the blood... So guess what? Every house in Jericho crumbled, but harlot, the ray of the harlot house remains silent because of what? By faith. What are we going with? Come on. You may say me rough or hungry or whatever. I don't care anymore. I am past those days. So shut your mouth and listen to what I'm saying and come into power, come into healing, come into freedom, come into deliverance, come into life now. I sometimes wonder, some of us love pity. So we hold on to, hold on. Woman, do you want to be loose? No, Jesus, um, I've been having this, you know, for 18 years. So I, 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 I can handle it, Jesus, as long as I can praise the Lord. But remember, the scripture said the spirit of infirmity bend our over. And she could by no means straighten herself up by herself. So Jesus come to you and I said, no, Lord, I'm, you know, praise the Lord. 
Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. You imagine 18 years walking bend over like this. And Jesus said, woman, you are loose from infirmity. And the Bible said immediately. We love pity. Some of us lazy and no one work. So Canada have, I, mean, I don't know if they have here at Jamaica. I've never heard about it at Jamaica. I'm, I'm not telling you that it's not there, but I didn't hear about it. But in Canada, they have disability program. So if you, if you walk... And Jesus come to set you free. Oh Lord, I love you. But you know, I'm I'm on disability. By faith, Rehab the harlot. By faith, Rehab the harlot. That kind of a life is a despicable life. But by faith, she change it. By faith. By faith. There was a young man by the name of Jabez. You know what Jabez mean? Sorrow. Pain. Because his mother was the one who gave him the name. Apparently something happened painfully. Either when she was giving birth or during the time of the pregnancy, Sister Jackie, she went through some kind of pain. She chose to hold on to the pain by naming her child pain. So every time you said Jabez, you're saying pain. But the Bible said, by faith, Jabez entreated the Lord. And the Lord heard him. My God, the Lord heard him. So what happened? When God responded to Jabez's prayer, because if you look at the prayer that he prayed, he even said to God, and that I, oh, that you may bless me and enlarge my border, and that I will not cause pain. Notice that I will not, because he know that my name is pain. I have not only been called pain, it put me in a position to experience pain. But the Bible said the Lord was entreated. Now, if God respond to you, with a name called pain. You think God is going to keep that? And one of the strange things about that passage of scripture, 1 Corinthians, 1 Chronicles chapter 1, it's in chapter 4 you read that. From chapter 1 to chapter 2, chapter 3, all the way down to that verse right in there. So, it's a list of names, genealogy. They are putting together those that are truly Israelites. And over 500 names from chapter 1 to that moment. And he you know, said not more. Holly just come in and said, and Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And he entreated the Lord. And after the Lord responded, then he go back and continue the list of names. The way the scripture introduces us to him, God interrupted the genealogy. <sighs> I wonder if I'm not get too used to me. Does God need to move me? Because some of you think that this is a joke. God interrupt. Shay, God interrupt interrupt the genealogy I am saying and I've seen God done it I can show you time and time again and in this room today God is ready to interrupt some things God is ready to interrupt some cycles God is ready to interrupt some cycles interrupt some things that The enemy has been lying to you and telling you that certain things will never change. Because he even, he even point out and say, look how long you're praying about it. Yes, you have been praying for a long time. Look how long you have been believing God. Yes, you have been believing God for a long time. He has been pointing that out. And if you believe that lie, he will imprison you. You need to, you listen to me, you need to understand how my God and your God operate. God is not a conventional God. I don't know if 
I can carry this. Can I deliver it today? I have it to, be, to deliver. So I have to deliver it. God is not a conventional God. He is indeed a God of order. But he's not a conventional God. And he's not governed by conventional, you know, things and the time and the order of man and how this. Uh-uh. Because if he, if, if he works in alignment with man, how would he be glorified? If he works with time as it is, how would you recognize that it's him? Because when Isaiah went and spoke to Ezekiah, King Ezekiah, and he says, God said to tell you, set your house in order, set your family in order, for you shall die and not live. When Isaiah left and go out of the king's court to leave the palace, Ezekiah turned, the Bible said, his face to the wall. And he cried out to God, prior, prior. Notice he's not praying a religious prayer. And he reminded God how he walked before him and how he kept his commandments. And God, the Bible said, God didn't talk to him. God stopped the prophet midway, somewhere in the foyer. And God said, go back, go back, go back. Because he has prayed to me. And let him know that I heard him. And I am going to add 15, 15, 15 more years. To his life. But watch this. Hear this. Ezekiah said to Isaiah the prophet. He said, how will I know? How will I know that God had 15 more years to my life? Isaiah said to him, do you want God to move the sun 10 degrees forward? Or 10 degrees backward? Ezekiah said, if God move it 10 degrees forward, that's easy because it's already going forward. Him say, I want you to tell God, move it 10 degrees backward. So the sun, the sun is already since I came at 3 p.m. And God is going to move it 10 degrees backward. If God moved the sun 10 degrees backward, understand what they taught us. What they taught us about the solar system. It's the earth that rotates around the sun. So if God is going to move the sun 10 degrees backward, I know the sun got to move. God is moving the earth. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Come on. There's a whole lot of things that has been going on in our life for, for years. There's a cycle of things that has been going on in our life for years. And we are comfortable with it. But today, today, God say, hey, hey. God say, hey. hey. And when Isaiah bring the message to God, God said, okay, so it shall be. So how Ezekiah would know that God rotate the earth in the opposite. What would you call that? Is that counterclockwise? <laughs> oh, brother Damien, brother Damien. Oh, God, oh, God. Oh, I, 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 I hear a sound in my gut. How great is our God. Oh, sing with me. How great is our God. Wow. Ezekiah on purpose went outside. Because the sundial was placed in a position where there is no tree around it, no form of shade. Because you have to have a clear, it must be in a position where there is absolutely nothing obstructing the sun. So he went. 
And he stood there and watched. And the sun and the sundial went in the opposite direction. And he walked away with confidence, knowing that God would have healed him. And 15 years has been added to his life. That's the God I'm talking about. I said, that's the God I'm talking about. I'm talking about a God that there is nothing in this world, in this life, that can stop him from coming to where you are and rooting up things and destroying things at the root and setting you free. If you will, if you will, if you will, The scripture on purpose, not everybody, but on purpose, the scripture leave us with clear evidence of yeah, why, why, would, why would God say, why would God have it? He is the one that inspired the writing of the scriptures. Why is he giving us the number of years that the woman with the issue of blood bled for? Why is the scripture telling us that the woman that was bent over by a demonic spirit, 18 years? Why is the scripture telling us that the man that was crippled at the poolside was 38 years? Why is the scripture telling us that the man that Peter and John healed at the temple gate, that he was above 40 years old and he was born crippled? Why is the scripture giving us? Because some of us, the devil wants you to believe that you have been going through that for too long and it's outside of God's purview and God can't do nothing because a long time this has gone. I have been going through this for how many years? There is no number of years that can stop God from showing up and turning the situation around right now as if... How, how long have you been in that financial situation? Huh? How long have you been sick? How long have you been going through whatever it is? How long? You think people in the scripture don't use time and years and day upon God too? When Jesus showed up, Martha, your brother shall rise again. Yes, Lord, I know, but it's the last day. Resurrection. Jesus said, no, 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 no. I am the resurrection and the life. Show me where you're lame. But Lord, by this time, by this time, he stinks. Because as if Jesus no know. You, you notice when God show up to deliver us, all we are doing is give God inf information like God, I look information from you. God a dummy, God a idiot, you know, no, 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 so you need to inform him of things here. And God, this is what the doctor say. And God, you know, this and that and that. We are tell God about. By this time he stinks because he has been in the grave four days now, Lord. The instruction is roll away. You know what the stone is? Doubt. You know what the stone is? Unbelief. You know what the stone is? Your opinions. You know what the stone is? Your emotions. You know what the stone is? Lies. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I learned some things early in my walk with God. That God is never looking for information from me. So I need to shut my mouth and receive. By this time, it's too late. By this time, Luke, John chapter 11, I'm not making up stuff, it's there, it's written. Martha said, Lord, by this time, 
he stinks. He's, the, 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 the old King James Version says, he stinketh. <laughs> because, because, because he has been in the grave now four days. When Jesus raised Jairus' daughter, it, she died hours. When Jesus raised, when Jesus raised the woman who had her only son in Nain, in Luke chapter 7, it was a day. Because in the Middle East up until now, when there, when there is a dead, it's one day. One day. So now, Jesus raising these other persons, even if they had not known about it before or whatever, when we look at it, it's one day, it's ours, there's a possibility that they might not have really died. God said, no, I have to bring it to a level. Because some of you are going to experience some things. So God wants to set it and put it on record for you to know that it doesn't matter how far, how many days, how many years, how deep, how dark. There is nowhere that God cannot show up. So Jesus said, this dead... It can be within hours. And I'm not going to show up while he's still sick and heal him. Because this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. So God is doing things to get what? Glory. So while some of you are fretting and worry yourself, stop worrying and fret. Make sure you're paying attention and hearing what God is saying. Because God is doing it not for you, but for his glory. For his glory. So that somebody else can get hope. So that you can have a genuine testimony. So when Jesus heard that he was sick, he stayed, he stayed two days more in the same place where he was when he got the message. Another thing about prayer. Many of you, you prayed, and you really prayed properly the first time. And you thought that God would have answered your prayer at a particular time that you have preconceived in your mind. God said, if I answer the prayer now, there is not much glory in it for me. Whew. So God... Hold off for it to get to a point, a place that when he shows up, you cannot, you cannot give nobody. <laughs> you can't give the doctor. You can't give the lawyer, you can't give the judge, you can't give no man the credit, but God alone. You get to that place that when God show up and do it, you, you open your mouth and you said, if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side. So Jesus stayed still two days in the same place. And then, when Lazarus died, within a day, they had the funeral, and they had a nice funeral, and they buried him. <laughs> they buried him. Some of us buried too quick. We are too quick to bury things because we can't handle the stench. But they buried him. And when they buried him, Jesus, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, the one who has been given all authority, he get up and said, I am going. <laughs> I am going to awake Lazarus. And Thomas said, if he's sleeping, He's doing well in sleep. Why would you want to go and wake him? Jesus, the Bible said, spoke plainly for them to understand. He said, Lazarus is dead. But watch him. Watch him. He did not leave a period there. 
Lazarus is dead, but, say but again. But. Appreciate the buts that come from God. <laughs> but I am glad for your sake that I was not there. That I was not there. That you may know and believe. That you may know and believe that God sent me. Even me, my life in Canada at this moment, God on purpose allows some things to happen to me. You think it's for my sake? It's for fear's sake and some of you now learn from it. Some of you are not learning from it. God and purpose, because you have been listening to me talking and watching, and some of you in question, the things he's saying, does he really, does he really believe it? And is it really true? But watch me. Watch me. Watch me and watch how I am behaving. And I am not at home drinking. Russian vodka to deal with my situation. I don't drink. You will come to our house and find Ray and his nephew there. You will come to our house and find red label wine. You will come to my house. I'm not going to tell you, say, you're not going to find some liquor. But it's not there for me to liquor myself when problem arise. Those red label wine, it's a part of my secret ingredients of fritters. <laughs> it's only one of the secret. That is only one. You not get it yet. <laughs> It's not there for me to drink it. And I am not sniffing something to make me high to deal with my situation. The God, the living God, the God of the Bible, the God of the Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior, the God who saved me and kept me and sent me here, he's still keeping me. So I want you to listen to me when I'm talking to you. That God has the power today in this room. You come in here one way and you don't have to come out here the way you came in here. God is ready right now to interrupt. children of Israel was in Egypt for 400 years and they had to be there because God stated that. God said it to Abraham. At the end of the 400 years, God showed up in the person of Moses to deliver them. God delivered Israel out of Egypt based on the calendar at that time. It would have been like almost the middle of the year. And when God delivered them, God said, this is going to be the beginning of your year. <laughs> I wonder if somebody will hear me today. So I'm going to prophesy to somebody right now that in the spirit... Literally in time, it's now April. But in the spirit, it's going to be a new year for you. Turn to somebody and say, Happy. Can you receive it? No, 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 shake your head, no, say nothing, just think. Can you receive it? Can you believe it? Can you believe it? Can you receive it? Because weeping may, may, may for some reason endure for a night. But 
Yeah, listen to me. God promises that in the morning. <laughs> hey, what is the spirit doing in this room today? I don't really know, but I'm following him. I'm following him. And who the meal is for, I am going to deliver it. And whoever it belongs to, I hope to God you receive your meal. Stop giving God information. He doesn't need it. He knows. He knows. Jesus knows all about my. <laughs> he knows. In John chapter 5, the crippled man that was crippled for 38 years, Sister Kim. The Bible said Jesus was on his way going to a feast in Jerusalem, but he went into the sheep market. And the Bible said he knew that the man had been there a long time. He no need no information from you. When he shows up, he's here to deliver. We stop our deliverance because we want to give God information. Oh, God. You know how long I've been going through this? Oh God, this happened to me. Oh God, she said, he said, that happened and that happened. And how long? You think God come for sit down and listen to you venting? You think God a psychiatrist? That he comes and he says, oh, sit on the couch and tell me about your problems. doesn't care about the problem. He cares about you in the problem and he comes to deliver you. You think, you think, I'm, you think I'm messing, I'm, I'm, I'm making this stuff up? Do you know how even people in this room right now, they are still saying to me, Pastor, you know, I am looking forward to the day, you know, to sit down with you and talk to you so that you can know me a little better. And you know what they want to talk to me about? You see, you, you say you see me as a man of God. And as a man of God, you want to consider with me to tell me about the history of your problem. That's how you see me? I did not study psychology. And I don't care to come to your house or for us to meet up at any place for you to tell me about yourself and tell me about all the stuff that you have been through. I'm a man of God. When Elijah come at your house, you know, tell Elijah about your problem. You ask Elijah, what can, what, what must I do? Go and borrow vessels. Not a few. And when you get the vessel, lock your door. And pour out the oil. When you finish pouring the oil, you come back to the man of God and say, man of God, I did what you said. He said, now go and sell, pay off your debt, and you and your son live off the rest. The state that the church is in today, we're looking for psychologies. So we have our pastor standing in the pulpit. Oh, I have my degree in psychology. Burn that! God, people doesn't need intellectual psychologists. What they need is a word from God. Yes, Pastor. I want to sit down with you one day and tell you where I'm coming from. That's how you see me? That, that's all you want to do. Sit down and tell me where you are come from. You mean that's what God sent me here for do? 
No, 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 laugh. This is a serious, this is a serious thing. You mean all the things that I have been going through, that's the reason why me I suffer them something there. So that you can sit down and tell me where you're coming from. And all the things that you have been through, it has been rough, pastor. So when you are come, I have to make sure I have all five bucks of tissue. Pastor, you the pastor. That's how a lot of you view me, and that's why you are not changing. Because you're not going to receive anything from me until you tell me your problem. I don't need to know you based on the problems that you have experienced. I need to know you based on your position in Christ. Because if I know you based on the problems that you have been through, you're a victim. <laughs> Let me say it again. If I know you based on the problems that you have been through, you are a victim. So in the world... A person who struggle with alcohol, what do they call them? An alcoholic. You see, what's their identity? They're an alcoholic. And once an alcoholic, they say, always an alcoholic, and you only see them. So there are those of us, you know, when we're talking about our situation. I am not saying that you can't talk about your problems, but how are you supposed to talk about it? It must be in, a, in the construct of a testimony. That you are telling... What the Lord has done for you. Not what you're going through and want me to pitch tent with you. And we, 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 Let me come back. You remember where I start? Where oh, oh, I end up on the street? Jesus curse the fig tree. Touch your neighbor and say, Jesus curse the fig tree. And say, neighbor, it dried up, not from the top. It dried up from the root. Say, <sighs> neighbor, I am believing with you today for that fig tree in your life to dry up from the root today. If I'm not a man of God, this is just gimmickry. If I'm not a man of God, this is just frills. If, not, if I'm not a man of God, this is just entertainment. Amen. Brother Kingsley, when they saw the fig tree, the Bible said, Jesus realized now that he got their attention. He should have gotten it from the evening before, but he didn't. Now that the fig tree is dried up and they saw it, and they said, Lord, the fig tree that you cursed, it dried up from the root. And Jesus said, not only will you be able to do. <laughs> you get it, Brother Wes? Not only will you be able to do what was done to the fig tree, but you see that mountain over there? If you have faith in God, you will say to that mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. And if you doubt not in your mind, you shall have you shall have, you shall have, you shall have whatsoever you say. Don't wait on nobody to say it. Do not wait on anybody to say 
you open your mouth and with faith in God, say it and believe that it's going to happen. So what say you? What say you? What have you been saying? Is it in alignment with faith in God? If it's not, you need to change. You need to change. Change how you talk. Because some fig tree needs to dry up. Some wild fig tree. Some, some fig tree that is not where they're supposed to be. You don't cut them down. You curse them. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. You don't climb the mountain. You tell it to move and doubt not. And then Jesus said this. Then Jesus said, right off, right off that statement, he said in the next verse, I think it's verse 24. Because from verse 22, when he says to them, have faith in God. In verse 24, he says, and when you pray, whatsoever thing <laughs> you request in the time of prayer, believe, watch this, believe that you receive, believe that you receive it and you shall have it. When do you believe that you receive the thing that you're, talk, you're, you're asking God about or you're praying to God about? In the moment of you praying, you believe that you receive it. So if you're asking God for the water, you believe that right at the moment you're praying, you believe that you have it. Don't wait to see the manifestation to say that God, right there, after you finish, praying, say, Father, thank you. And from that moment on, you're thanking him because you only give thanks when you receive it. And Jesus said, if you believe that, you will have it. So the manifestation should be because you have believed that you received it from the very initial stage that you prayed. I'm going to stop here. Is that mine? <laughs> I didn't even see when this come off. Every single person in the scripture that you read about, they all, whatever they came into, whatever happened for them, they all received it by God does not do anything for anybody without. <sighs> Let me touch on this and, and stop. I'm still talking about faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, the statement I just made, you think I'm making it up. And we need to get this right. And I'm not going to move from here until we get it right. In verse 1, now faith is the substance. So this is not the first time faith is mentioned in the book. The first time the word faith is used is in chapter 4. Right? So when we get to chapter 11, it is actually giving us a summary for you to understand how faith is positioned and how it is meant to operate in your life moving forward. It says now, notice now, when. That's why, that's why Jesus said when you pray, you believe that you receive. Because faith is not tomorrow. Faith is not yesterday. Faith is always now. Now. Now faith is the sub, the sub, the sub. So it's how you bring yourself under, under your father. 
God is your father in this configuration. So how you bring your faith yourself under him, you experience the things that he intends for you to come into. Now faith is the substance of things. Not things as you think about things. It's the things that God wants, that God as your father wants you to come into. If your earthly father know how to give you good things, how much more will your heavenly father give good things to those who ask him? But you have to view him rightly in order for you to come into those things. So it's a faith is a substance of things over the evidence of the things not seen with the natural eyes. So you believe in God for something and you get, a, you get a word. You have a word. You have a promise on it. You start to talk about the thing as if you are already touching the thing. You are already enjoying the thing. That when you talk about it and, and they say, so where is it? They say, um, you're not able to see it, but I can. But in a few days, I will show you. <laughs> And watch this. I said a while ago, every single person we read about in the scripture, whatever it is that they came into, whatever they received from God, it was all by faith. Watch verse 2. For by it. It what? What is the it? By faith, the elders obtain a good testimony. And by faith... We understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen with the natural eyes were not made from things which are visible. I wonder if you receive your meal right now. I wonder if you're going to get up and walk out here because, oh, well, Pastor, every day, I didn't feel anything. I didn't see anything. Nothing not really happened for me. I still feel the same way when I come in here. Interpret it for some of them who don't understand that. But I said say nothing more about you. I saw me say it and I saw me LFE. But right now, if you are sick, have you received your healing? That I'm not waiting for something visible to give me hope. I have a promise and God cannot lie. Have you received your breakthrough? Yeah. If you are genuinely, if you're genuinely in need of a car, have you received the car? Yes. Me say, have you received the car? Because when you leave here today, you need to be driving the car home. Yes. If you are genuinely in need of a house and you believe that God will and he cares about your needs, you need to leave here and go home and open the door and go into your house. I'm going to do laundry. Light the stove. Do macaroni and cheese if you have to. But you need to go in the kitchen and go cook. Spread up the bed. Vacuum the floor. Do not doubt. Do not go back on what you believe and what you receive in this house today. Refuse to doubt it. Refuse. The enemy is going to come with a lot of things. But do not accept it. I am healed. I am delivered. I am driving my car. I have a car. I have a house. Can you see my keys? Yeah. 
Do you want to come over and spend a weekend with me? That's not gimmickry. If you have faith and doubt not, it shall be according to your words. I'm going to stop here. Whew. Ay, 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 ay. It's not easy, but I'm going to stop here. I'm going to stop here. I'm going to stop here. Stop here. I'm going to stop here. Can you stand with me, please? very important for you to take the time to read your Bible. Some of you have the Bible playing around you. You say, because you heard me say it, that I do that at my house. That's not a joke for me. That's not a makeup stuff for me. <laughs> That's not a made-up stuff for me. Even right now, on my watch, my watch. The scriptures are playing right now. You see it? See it running? If I go here, you see every spot where I have one of the speaker. They're in group, in the group management. So if I go into this, you will see basement, bedroom four, bedroom three, den, family room, garage, Emmanuel room, and main bathroom. I can control all the speaker from my risk right here. Those scriptures are at home playing right now. The moment you see that moving, that, it's playing. And if I tap my finger two times, it stop it. And if I tap my finger two times, it start play again. <laughs> <laughs> scriptures are they playing? And listen to me. Ask my wife, Sister Kim. The scriptures are not just playing in my house. I am literally listening. Literally listening. And I'm saying to you. If you're going to receive from me effectively, pay attention to the scriptures. Because I'm not here to make up stuff and give you gimmickry and give you frills. You're supposed to walk out of this room today and walk out here with meal. And when you walk out here, whatever Satan was doing, the, fact, the moment you walk out here, he's supposed to even start to back up because something has been downloaded on you. Something is overshadowing you. Something is resting upon you. There is an anointing that he can't touch. The Spirit of God said through me, and I'm going to remind you of what I said. It's not a joke that as God delivered Israel out of Egypt after 400 years, and God said to them the very night, 12 a.m. is the threshold of a new day. And the very night when God delivered them out of Egypt, God said, this will be the beginning of your year. I said, today, today in this room, somebody in line, God is saying to you, it's the beginning. 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 
I don't know where you need to see that. I don't know where you need to experience that. But God said, that's what I am supposed to release to you. You need, whatever it is, you're going to take a hold of that. And God says, everything that has been going on up until this moment, today, there is a threshold. There is a threshold. Carl, Carl, I think Carl is here. Carl, 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 come here, please. No, 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 I didn't want you to bring them. I want you to come first. We came across each other's path, I think, was when last year? In December, you came to one of the fasting meetings. And ever since, we have been communicating. I want you to receive this today. I can't force you to, but I want to tell you what God is saying. A threshold where this is concerned, right here, is the threshold. When you step over, when you step over, when you walk out of this room and you step over this threshold, you're leaving the room. Once you're over this side, you're in the room. But the moment you step over, the moment you step over that, you leave the room. God want me to tell you today that there are some things that you have seen you have experienced, which I don't even care for you to tell me, because it no matter right now, God shows up not for you to give him information, but for you to receive whatever it is that is going on. I want you to stand right here. And in this room, stand right there. In this room, this is where you have been experiencing some things and some things that have attached itself to you for years. God say, you are stepping out. It's a new beginning. Step over. And the moment you step over that, you are no longer in the room. It's a new order. It's a new system. It's a new day. Yakatara baba kusheke sotorobo sandaya baba ba. The enemy wants you to think that you can't come out of the room. The enemy wants you to think that you're connected to the room. And whatever is going on in the room, you have to accept it. The enemy wants you to think that nothing will ever change. Because this is where you come. You grow up. Everything that you've been experiencing. But the devil is a liar. God say, I set before you an open door. God say, I set before you an open door. I set before you an open door. I set before you an open door, God says. So when you step through the door, you're stepping out. You're stepping out of something and you're stepping into something. Jesus said, I am the door. Jesus said, I am the door. Jesus said, I am the door. So when you go through the door, you're supposed to, you're supposed to leave some things. When you go through the door, things are supposed to change. When you go through the door, things are supposed to shift. I am the door. I am the door. I am the door. He said, by me. Whoa, ho, 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 ho. If any man enter, if any man enter. Father, thank you. Today, today, 
today, today is the beginning, the beginning, the beginning. Today is the beginning, the beginning, the beginning of your, your new life. Your new life. Your new life. Those of you that are watching, those of you that are watching, you're still watching. Wherever you are, some of you are in your house, you may be in a restaurant or something, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if anybody cares, if anybody are watching, or it doesn't matter. Get up from where you are. Go through a door, go through a door, whether it's the door from the living room to the kitchen or wherever, go through a door. And as you go through that door, let it be a tangible, tangible, tangible act on your part that you believe the word of God, you receive the word of God today. And every time from this day forward, even when you see that door area, it is going to remind you that whatever it is that you were dealing with up until this moment, you have stepped out of it and you have stepped into a new season, a new season, a new anointing that God is releasing upon your life. Do not tolerate that things are going to remain the same. Father, we give you praise. Somebody lift your hands and give him thanks and give him praise because you receive it. You believe that it is done. Come on, go ahead and give him thanks because you know that you have received it. Give him thanks because you know that you have received it. Don't clap. Give him thanks because you know that you receive it. So now, I have to change my conversation. I have to change my way of thinking. Because if I believe, then it's what I believe is going to dictate how I think from this day forward and how I talk and how I act. Do not cancel. Do not cancel what you have received today. Father, I give you the glory and the honor and the praise as we leave this place, I thank you that we're leaving with our mails. We're leaving with our package. Because you, you who knows what we have need of before we asked. You have showed up in your word. And Father, we received it. By faith, the elders obtain a good report. Father, the elders have obtained a good report. And so, Father, today we are joining the great cloud of witnesses that that God, that God is my God in this generation. And, Father, I am giving you room to show off yourself strong. In the name of your Son, so be it. So be it. For the rest of the week, Father, I thank you for what will continue to manifest because of what we believe today. We're not waiting to see it, but we are expecting a manifestation because of what I believe today. Because of what I believe today. Be, be it. So be it, Father. So be it. Be it unto us according to your word. In Christ's name. Amen. 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 Bless you. Love you. Enjoy the rest of your day. And as it, whew, I wasn't even thinking that today is actually the beginning of a new week, right? Today is Sunday. And as the beginning of the week is, so it is in the spirit that there is a new beginning. There is a new beginning. I love you. And God's willing, I will see you. And Sunday, Sunday. So until then, hold on to your mail. Hold on to your mail. Hold on to the, your mail. Until it takes on flesh. Because the word must become flesh. Amen. Amen. 
Wow. 